Universe City is by no means finished. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing Dr. Sally K. Ride, former NASA astronaut and the first American woman in space. A native of Los Angeles, California, Dr. Ride earned four degrees from Stanford University, a Bachelor of Arts in English, a Bachelor's, Master's, and PhD in Physics, and in 1978, she was selected for astronaut training and reported to NASA. Dr. Ride flew in space twice, and our hearts went with her. During her first flight in 1983, the five-member crew deployed communication satellites for Canada and Indonesia and performed the first satellite deployment and retrieval with the shuttle's robot arm. Just one year later, Dr. Ride embarked on her second space flight. During this eight-day mission, the crew deployed the Earth Radiation Budget Satellite, conducted scientific observations from Earth, and demonstrated the potential for satellite refueling by astronauts. Dr. Ride was assigned to the third space shuttle flight. However, plans for that flight were interrupted by the space shuttle Challenger accident in January 1986. She was then appointed to the presidential commission that investigated the accident, became assistant to the NASA administrator for long-range planning, and created NASA's Office of Exploration. Dr. Ride's projective career continues. To date, she has written four books, including To Space and Back, and the mystery of Mars. Currently a professor of physics at the University of California, San Diego. She has served as president of the internet company space.com and is CEO of Imaginary Lines, a corporation that encourages girls of middle school age to pursue mathematics and science. In her presentation tonight, Dr. Ride will ask us to reach for the stars. Please join me in giving a great Ball State welcome to Dr. Sally Ride. Thank you. Thank you very much. When Jim Lovell of Apollo 13 fame was uh, circling the moon, he looked back at Earth and called our planet a grand oasis in the great vastness of space. That's extremely unusual eloquence for an astronaut. You're not going to hear any more of that this evening. <laughs> the space program is a shining example of what an imaginative, collaborative, dedicated team can accomplish when all its members are working towards a common goal. The space program was really born in the imagination of just a few visionaries, but it very quickly became the dream of an entire nation. Literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people contributed their piece to the space program to make that dream a reality. Today, when the shuttle rockets into space. It's lifted by the hard work and the creativity of a very, very diverse team with a very diverse set of skills and with a wide range of responsibilities. Today, uh, NASA is at the forefront of a revolution. It's a revolution to understand our planet and to understand our place in the universe. But we're also at the forefront of a revolution. It's also a revolution that involves the marriage of innovation and innovation. It's a revolution in the way that people learn, communicate, and contribute to our knowledge and our future. One of the things that I'm going to focus on a little bit later in this talk and that I'm focusing on now uh, with my work is to make sure that the girls growing up today are an increasing part of that revolution. What I'd like to do this evening is uh, to try to give you a little bit of a sense of how I got involved in the space program and a little bit of a sense of what it's like to actually be up in space. Um, to help me do that, I'm going to be taking advantage of one of the advantages that astronauts have over most speakers in the world, which is that we've got great pictures. So I've brought some pictures along with me, and I'm going to try to give you a sense of uh, what, the, what the Earth looks like from an astronaut's perspective looking out the window of the space shuttle or the, or the space station. My goal here is, is also to leave plenty of time for questions, so please be thinking about any questions that you might want to ask me, and I, I think we've got some mics set up down at the front, or I can try to take questions uh, uh, just from the audience. We'll see which, which works best, but be thinking of, of uh, any questions you'd like to ask as we, as we go through, 
go through this. I was a graduate student at uh, Stanford University, just a couple months away from my PhD in physics, when uh, I was sitting in the Stanford student cafeteria one morning. It was a Tuesday morning, about 8 in the morning, and I was drinking coffee furiously trying to wake up for the class that I had to teach a little bit later that morning. And I still remember to this day opening up the Stanford student newspaper, the Stanford Daily, and seeing in the lower right-hand corner of page three of the Stanford Daily an advertisement that the Center for Re Research on Women had put into the Daily on NASA's behalf, saying that NASA was accepting applications for astronauts. Now, this was a really big deal at the time because NASA had not selected any new astronauts at all to the astronaut corps in over 10 years at that point. And it was an even bigger deal because NASA had never selected women into the astronaut corps, and the ad made it clear that that was no longer going to be the case, that they were seeking applications from and intending to bring women into the astronaut, the astronaut corps. So, um, as you can imagine, I ripped that ad out of the newspaper, checked the yes, please send me more information, and stuffed it in the very first mailbox that I saw on my way back to the physics department. Um, there were quite a few other people that did that same thing. Uh, about 8,000 of us applied. NASA selected 35 of us to join the astronaut corps to move to Houston to train as astronauts and to join the 20 or so astronauts who were still in the astronaut corps from the Apollo program. But we were the first group to come in specifically for the, uh, the space shuttle. So you could say that I got the job that I got by responding to an ad in the newspaper. It just shows that it pays to read your student newspaper. Um, I should add that my father was probably the happiest person on the planet when I was selected to be an astronaut. Um, my father was a political science professor at a community college in Southern California. My father didn't have a, a scientific bone in his body. And he was about to have a daughter with a PhD in astrophysics. My father did not know what astrophysics was. My father could not explain to his friends what his daughter was about to do for a living. And then I became an astronaut, and my father's problems were over. He understood what an astronaut was. His, parents un his uh, friends understood what I was going to be doing uh, with the rest of my life. So he was a very, very happy man. Uh, the 35 of us that were selected into the astronaut corps in that astronaut class are pretty reflective of what NASA was looking for at the time and is still looking for in the astronaut corps today. Um, of the 35, 15 were test pilots, 20 were scientists or engineers, and that group of 35 also included the first six women astronauts. And all 35 of us have uh, flown in space at least once, most of us twice, so we think NASA did a pretty good job of, uh, of selecting astronauts in that particular, that particular group. We joined NASA actually a little bit before the first space shuttle flight. The shuttle was uh, well on its way to development and was pretty close to the launch pad, but hadn't, hadn't yet launched. The first four flights of the space shuttle were staffed by crews of two astronauts, two astronauts with test pilot backgrounds and, two, and astronauts who'd been around since the Apollo program. Um, and it turns out that, that there were, uh, was a pretty good reason for having only two astronauts on each of those first four test flights. Um, NASA was concerned enough about whether the space shuttle would really work that they wanted the astronauts to um, have ejection seats and be able to eject from the space shuttle, especially during the last phases of uh, approach and landing, in case anything went wrong. So they put ejection seats into the space shuttle. The ejection seats are really big. They could only fit two ejection seats into the cockpit of the shuttle. They thought it would be really bad for morale to have a crew of four and only two ejection seats. Um, so they, they held the size of the crew down. But it's actually easy to understand why there were a lot of questions about whether the space shuttle was really going to work. This was a totally new concept. You know, rockets before the space shuttle kind of looked like rockets. They looked like they belonged on a launch pad. They looked like they'd be able to slice up really cleanly through Earth's atmosphere during launch. Astronauts used to sit in capsules on the top of the rockets 
so that when all the fuel was burned out, the only thing left was a little capsule that would orbit Earth or head off to the moon. Once it was time for the capsule to re-enter Earth's, uh, re Earth's atmosphere, it would fire a couple little uh, jets and come screaming in through the atmosphere and then pop out a parachute and kind of flutter down and, and land in the ocean and bob up and down and up and down and up and down. The astronauts hoped for not too long uh, before the capsule was plucked out of the water and brought back to, brought back to land. The space shuttle was going to be something completely different from that. The idea was, of course, to take something that looked for all the world like an airplane, stand it up on its tail, slap it up against the world's ugliest orange fuel tank, and then put two things that kind of looked like rockets on the side. Move that whole stack to the launch pad, where it really looks kind of like a mess, and hope that that whole thing would launch uh, successfully up through Earth's atmosphere like the really sleek rockets before it had. Then when all the fuel was burned out and what was left was this airplane, this airplane was supposed to orbit like the capsules before it had. And probably what was most important to the astronauts, um, once it was time to re-enter and land, this airplane was supposed to re-enter Earth's atmosphere and fly like an airplane but not like any airplane that anyone had ever built before or in fact has built since. This was an airplane that was supposed to re-enter Earth's atmosphere at Mach 25. That's 17,000 miles an hour. Halfway around the world from the runway that it's supposed to land on with absolutely no engines at all. The space shuttle is a glider and it glides halfway around the world slowing down only by uh, friction with Earth's atmosphere to land on, you hope, the right runway. So there was a lot of question about whether this was going to work. But the first four flights actually did a good job of demonstrating that the concept was a good one. So after the, the fourth flight, NASA expanded the crew. Uh, they expanded the crew to kind of a normal crew today of um, five astronauts, two of whom have test pilot backgrounds, three of whom have science or engineering backgrounds. And to this day, that's a typical crew on a, on a space shuttle flight or a flight going up to the, the space station. There may be up to seven on the crew. There are rarely more than, uh, more than that. Uh, could we have the first slide, please? Now let me just start showing you some of the, some of the photos. Yeah, if you can get the lights down maybe a little bit lower, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, this is what the shuttle looks like just a few seconds after liftoff. Most of the power on launch is uh, provided by the solid rockets, the two uh, white rockets on the side. Um, they burn all their fuel, and there's nothing in them but fuel after only two minutes. And at the end of those two minutes, you're already 25 miles away from the launch pad. So that gives you some idea of uh, how much power they've actually got. Um, once they burn out, they're pushed away, and the shuttle goes the rest of the way to orbit on the strength of its main engines that are uh, burning liquid fuel that's supplied by the big orange tank. And the three engines are the three white circles you see in the middle of the, <clears throat> the, middle of the screen. It takes them about another six and a half minutes to burn all the liquid fuel that's carried in that tank. So it's a total of eight and a half minutes from ignition on the launch pad until all the fuel's gone and the space shuttle is in orbit and the astronauts inside it are weightless in orbit around Earth. Um, this is what the, the space shuttle looks like when it's in orbit. Um, I used the example of an airplane. It's, a, it's actually a pretty good analogy. If you were going to get in, uh, uh, get in a, an airplane um, in uh, Chicago and fly to Washington, D.C., you'd get in something just about the size of the space shuttle. But what would be the passenger section of an airliner is open to space during a space shuttle mission. That's where we carry our experiments or the communication satellites or the pieces of the space station, whatever the space shuttle is going to carry into orbit. The only part of the shuttle that's pressurized where the astronauts can live and work comfortably without putting on big bulky spacesuits is what would be the cockpit area of the airliner or kind of the nose of the, uh, of the shuttle. This picture was actually taken on my first flight 
we uh, were the first, um, the first flight to use the space shuttle's robot arm that you can see in the picture to let go of a satellite. And the satellite we let go of was kind of a test satellite, uh, and it carried a set of cameras that we could use to point back at us and take pictures, uh, pictures of us. We were also the first flight to recapture a satellite using the, the robot arm. But we took a lot of pictures um, of ourselves uh, while the shuttle was, uh, while the satellite was, was uh, moving away from us. In fact, um, uh, we spent probably millions and millions of taxpayer dollars putting the robot arm in the shape of a seven so that everybody knew, would know that it was STS-7 that took this picture. Uh, this is the crew of STS-7, my first flight. Um, I put this in to, uh, uh, to give you a sense of how little room there is in the cockpit of the space shuttle. There are two rooms in the shuttle, um, each about the size of the cockpit. The uh, uh, other living, living room is a little bit larger, but not very much. We were the first crew of five, and you can see that we're stretched from one side of the cockpit to the other. We're as far away from the camera as we can get. So there just isn't very much room in the, uh, in the shuttle. Um, four of us on this flight were rookies. We were on our first flight. Only one of us had ever been in space before. That was Bob Crippen, who was the commander of the flight. He's the uh, second from the left. The other four of us were the first four from that class of 35 uh, new space shuttle astronauts to get to go into, into space. There are a couple of different ways that you can tell that we took this picture while we were weightless in orbit instead of uh, uh, in the simulator on the ground. Uh, one of them is, for those of you who are up close, take a look at the necklace that's around my neck. You'll see that it's floating. Uh, the rest of you, just look at where I've got my hands. I've got my right hand on um, Rick's shoulder and my left hand on his wrist. I'm actually holding Rick down, keeping him from floating up and ruining our, our crew picture. Uh, let's see, I should point out actually a couple of the other people in this, in this photo. The, the guy down right in the middle at the bottom, Rick Houck, uh, later went on to be the commander of the first flight after the Challenger accident. He was the commander of the return to flight of the space shuttle. And the guy on the far left, um, Norm Thagard, later went on to become the first American to ever launch on a Russian rocket. He was the first one to spend what I'm sure was a very... Uh, pleasurable four months on the space station Mir. Okay, I said that I wanted to give you a, um, an idea of what the, the Earth looks like to astronauts looking out the window of the space shuttle. And the first lesson is this is not it. Um, this is, of course, what the, what the Earth looked like to the Apollo astronauts who went to the moon back in the late 1960s and early 1970s. But I guarantee you that if you go home and ask your family or your neighbors what astronauts see when they look out the window of the space station or the space shuttle, they'll describe to you the big blue marble that was made famous by the, uh, the photographs sent back by the Apollo astronauts. And the reason is that these pictures have become so ingrained in our collective consciousness that it's, that's what everyone associates with an astronaut's view back at Earth. But in fact, of course, the moon is a long ways away. It's a quarter of a million miles away. The Earth looks really small. Um, but the space shuttle orbits Earth only a couple hundred miles above the surface of the Earth. So we don't get to see the same big blue marble that the Apollo astronauts did. On the other hand, the advantage that we've got is that uh, uh, we can see features on the Earth in a lot more detail than they could. This is what uh, the view looks like out the shuttle window if you look off uh, towards the horizon. This is a picture of Florida. Let me see if I can focus this a little bit better. There we go. There are lots of things that you can see in this picture. First of all, notice that you can't see the whole planet. You can't even see the whole United States. In fact, you don't see the whole East Coast, um, but the view isn't so bad. Um, there's a big bank of clouds off the east coast of Florida in the Atlantic. 
take a look at the different colors in the water around the state of Florida. That's indicative of, of uh, different depths of the water. The kind of aqua color is really um, uh, shallow water. Um, and there's one thing in this, this picture that, that illustrates uh, one of the most striking uh, this, m one of the most striking sights to astronauts when they first look off towards the horizon. Um, take a look at where the blackness of space ends and Earth begins. You'll notice that going all the way across the screen, there's a really, really thin royal blue line. Well, that royal blue line is Earth's atmosphere. That's all there is of it. That's all that separates everything we know on our planet from the vacuum and the emptiness of, of space. And that uh, the fragility of the atmosphere is one of the most striking sights to every astronaut the first time he or she looks off towards the horizon like this. Now, if you're going to look um, straight down instead of off towards the horizon, this is the kind of detail that you can see. This is a picture looking down at uh, Cape Canaveral. Um, off the Florida, the east coast of Florida, and the Kennedy Space Center, where uh, space shuttles launch from and land. Notice the detail that you can see here. You can actually see um, bridges across the rivers. You can see the space shuttle runway where the shuttle lands. That's the white diagonal line about two-thirds of the way up towards the middle of the, the picture. Um, you can see uh, where the launch pads are. You can actually see large shopping malls in the area. A lot of detail. I wanted to uh, show you some of the natural features that you can see and by analogy or, or by extension that you could study if you had scientific instruments in this, um, this same orbit. Um, this is a picture looking through the Straits of Gibraltar. That's Spain on the left and North Africa on the right. And just uh, take a look at, at Spain and notice that the southern part of the country is kind of a light brown, and that light brown changes very abruptly to a much darker brown about a third of the way up the, the uh, country. That line of the abrupt color change is actually a long earthquake fault. It's a seismic fault over 1,000 uh, kilometers long. So seismic, seismic features like that are really, really easy to see from space. Um, this is a, a picture of uh, Israel that looks like I put in backwards, so I apologize. Um, the Mediterranean sea, sea, which should be on the left of the screen, is on the right of the screen. Um, and the, big, the uh, little Sea of Galilee is right in the middle of the picture, and then directly below it is the kind of oblong-shaped Dead Sea. And if you just let your eyes go from the Sea of Galilee straight down to the Dead Sea, notice that you're following a straight line that's pretty visible. That's the Levantine Fault, which is a major fault structure in the Middle East. And it's that fault that is the reason that the Sea of Galilee is where it is and that the Dead Sea is where it is. Um, and that same fault continues over a thousand, <clears throat> a thousand kilometers to the south and is the same fault that opens up to form the Red Sea. This is um, really an interesting, interesting photograph because it's uh, a photograph of the Middle East, which of course is in the news a lot lately and has been for many, many years. But another one of the, the things that strikes every astronaut is that when you look down on the planet, and here's a great example, you just don't see the boundaries between the countries, that these are all artificial boundaries that we've set up and established over time, and that if you pull away and get the perspective from space, you don't see those artificial boundaries that, uh, that we've established. Okay, um, we're in the same part of the world. Um, the Mediterranean Sea is oriented correctly this time. It's the, in the upper part of the screen, and where we just were was at the very, very top of the screen, and uh, the Dead Sea is just at the top corner of the screen, and you can follow that same fault straight down about a third of the way in from the right of the screen to see where it opens up to form the, Dead sea, the uh, Red Sea about halfway down this, the screen. The other thing that's really prominent in this picture is the Nile River Delta. That's the, the big uh, green triangular feature on the left side of the screen. 
Of course, what you're seeing is the vegetation that can grow in the Nile River Delta as a result of the irrigation of the, of the water. And in fact, you can see the Nile River trailing off uh, the bottom of the screen towards the middle of the, the screen. And again, what you're seeing, although if you get close enough to the picture, you can actually see the water of the Nile River, what uh, you're seeing from, from back there is the vegetation that can grow along the banks of the Nile as a result of the irrigation of the, uh, of the river. Um, the other thing that this picture shows you is uh, just in, in its different colors and um, uh, some of the patterns that you're seeing are that it's really easy to discern different types of rocks, uh, different uh, types of land use, and you can also see, if you look, uh, look closely, water drainage patterns so that it's very easy to study water resources and water management as well. This is what a hurricane looks like from, from orbit. This is a hurricane that was active in the Indian Ocean during my second flight. Let's see if I can focus this a little bit. And just take a look at the, the feeder bands of this hurricane and the detail that you can see in, the, um, in those bands. Uh, this is probably a couple hundred miles across. Um, the next slide is going to be looking right down the eye of this hurricane. And here you're, you're seeing all the way to the water. You're seeing the water of the Indian Ocean. And just take a look at the structure that you can see in the eye wall. This is a, this is a great picture. I kind of wish I had taken it. Um, this is a picture of the Mississippi River Delta, one of the places where the Mississippi dumps into the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, this is just uh, another indication of the sorts of, of uh, things that you could study from, from space. Um, if you just look around uh, the, the delta, uh, you, you can almost imagine the sediment being dumped into the water. You can actually see the muddier water right near the land. And in fact, if you were to compare this photograph with a picture taken a week later or a week before, you'd be able to see differences in the sedimentation pattern in the water and actually quantify some of the, the soil that was being dumped into the Gulf by the Mississippi River after its trip down the middle of the United States. Uh, you can see vegetation on the land. It turns out you can also see vegetation in the water, believe it or not. This is a picture taken off um, the coast of southern Africa, actually off the coast of Namibia. And what you're seeing here, the big aqua-colored splotch right in the middle of the screen, is actually billions and billions and billions and billions of phytoplankton. Now, phytoplankton are microscopic single-cell plants, but there are so many of them that the chlorophyll in each of the cells discolors the water and makes it visible even from space, in fact, easily visible from space. The um, interesting thing is that phytoplankton are the bottom of the food chain, and what that means is that where there are phytoplankton, there are going to be fish. So the fishing industry now routinely uses photographs from space to determine where to send the, the fishing fleets. Let's move on to some of the effects of civilization that you can see from, from space. This is a picture looking down at a corner of Portugal. And uh, we're actually looking down uh, over an area near Lisbon, um, Lisbon and Lisbon's International Airport. What you see in this picture are contrails left by airplanes going in and out of uh, Lisbon's airport. In fact, if you, you can trace these contrails back and actually trace out the arrival and departure routes at the airport that day. Uh, this is a picture looking all the way across Brazil from east to west. So where the clouds cut off there are the Andes Mountains, and then just beyond that, uh, you see the Earth's horizon, and, and uh, if you could see a little further, you'd see the Pacific Ocean off there. Um, the astronauts who took this picture ta thought they were taking kind of an artistic picture of a cloud-covered day in Brazil with the clouds being, being cut off by the Andes Mountains and then the horizon uh, off in the corner. It turns out what they were actually taking a picture of wasn't a cloudy day uh, in Brazil at all, but a typical day during the dry season in that country and what they thought was clouds was, in fact, accumulated smoke and haze from all the individual fires that are typically set during the dry season to clear parts of the Amazon forest. And what they thought were individual either puffy clouds or thunderclouds 
were actually um, plumes of smoke over individual fires. So what you're seeing here are actually many, many tens of, of fires and the smoke above them and the general pall that's created over the entire country as a result of the accumulated uh, smoke from, from setting fires to the, to the forest to clear the land. That uh, one big um, smoke cloud right in the middle of the screen it was over a, an enormous fire. Um, those of you that remember the, the, uh, the press around the, the huge fires in Arizona and Colorado um, earlier this summer, that fire is, is uh, larger than those fires were. If you look straight down at the Amazon forest during, this, uh, during a different time of year so that you can see to the ground, this is the kind of, uh, kind of thing you see. Um, this is kind of a typical uh, cross cross-hatched pattern that shows where the, the forest has been um, cleared away, uh, usually just to clear the, clear the land for use of the, uh, use of the wood or uh, use of the land. Okay, this is what a sunset looks like um, from space. Um, you know, well, the, when the space shuttle's uh, going around the Earth, it's traveling really, really fast. It travels about 17,500 miles an hour. That's five miles a second. If you do the math, that means that you, you go once around the world every 90 minutes. And if you think about that for a second, it means you're in daylight for about 45 minutes and nighttime for about 45 minutes. That means you see one sunrise and one sunset every 90 minutes, or 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every 24 hours. So every astronaut has a photograph that looks about like this. Uh, but you can see why. It's an absolutely beautiful sight. And you can see a lot of detail, probably a surprising amount of detail, in Earth's atmosphere. Just in the structure of the atmosphere, you can see the different layers of the atmosphere. And here you're seeing uh, a group of thunderstorms, v enormous thunderstorms. They're kind of silhouetted against uh, the atmosphere. This is what the Earth looks like at night. Um, a lot of people uh, just assume that um, astronauts are glued to the window during the daylight part of the orbit, looking back at Earth, seeing the sights like the ones I've been showing you in the, the photographs. And then when we get to the night side of the planet, we quick get back to work and do all the things that the taxpayers are paying us to do. Actually, it turns out nothing could be further from the truth. We're at the windows all the time. And the, and the reason is that uh, this is what the Earth looks like at night. There are no big cities in this picture. Um, this is a picture uh, of uh, the middle of the United States. And uh, as I said, there are no big cities here. These are all small cities, but they just stand out really clearly from, uh, from a couple hundred miles up. You can see the, uh, you know, you, you, as you look at this, you can convince yourself that you can kind of see how the city's grown and how, it's, how they're spreading. You can see the, the roads that connect the cities, even though none of these are freeways. These are all small, uh, small roads. Um, probably, if you lived in this area, you could probably pick out your favorite 7-Eleven. I mean, it's, it's a lot of clarity in these, these photographs. One of my um, most vivid memories from being in space, and there are a lot of them, but one of the most vivid was on, from my second flight. Uh, we carried mostly Earth-observing instruments, and that meant that our windows were pointed towards the Earth most of the time, so we had a great view through that whole flight. And we had one orbit um, at night that came right up the east coast of the United States. And we could see Miami from about 200 miles away and then see the entire east coast outlined in lights, a solid set of lights all the way up north of Boston. And that, that trip took us about a little over five minutes to make, make it all the way up the east coast of the United States. Absolutely spectacular. Okay, I want to uh, talk just for a second about uh, the mission that I'm on today. And, and that mission is to encourage girls and young women to pursue their interests in math, science, and, and technology. And I'm doing this um, through, I think uh, you heard a little bit in the introduction about Imaginary Lines. That's a company that I started a little bit over a year ago with some friends who are also scientists or engineers uh, with this focus. And what we're trying to do is create a whole series of events and programs and activities that will encourage girls, initially girls in middle school, 
to keep up their interest and their fascination with, uh, with math and science. And let me give you the motivation behind the company. This probably won't surprise many of you. You know, if you look around at the technical workforce today, you find that still only 9% of engineers are women, only 20% of scientists are women. That's enormously up from 1970, when less than 1% of the engineers in this country, if you can believe that, were women. So it's an enormous increase, but it's still not nearly as a higher percentage as we expect that it, that it should be and, and will be. Most, um, most companies, most high-tech companies, are um, furiously trying to recruit women into, the, uh, into their workforce. But as they go around to uh, universities like Ball State or Purdue or Stanford, what they're finding is that women aren't graduating with technical degrees in the numbers that they could really easily absorb and would like to absorb into the, the workforce. So, so they go um, beat up the university presidents and say, why, don't, why aren't you graduating more women in these fields? And the university presidents say, don't look at us. They're not coming in out of high school in the numbers that, that we would like. Uh, the interesting flip side of this, though, is that if you go back to elementary school and you walk into a third grade classroom and you ask how many of you are interested in science, you'll see as many girls' hands go up as boys. And in fact, there was a, a survey recently of fourth graders throughout the country. Um, and one of the questions that they were asked, one of many, was, do you like science? And that was the wording of the question, do you like science? 68% um, of the fourth grade boys said they liked science. 66% of the fourth grade girls said they liked science. Now, there are two messages there um, that are both that are good news for the country. One is, that's a lot of kids. That's two-thirds of the fourth graders uh, are still curious about the world. Um, they're interested in trying to, trying to understand how the world works. And they haven't yet been turned off to science. The other message is, it's as many girls as boys. But then something mysterious happens come middle school. And it's uh, sometimes in uh, sixth grade or seventh grade or eighth grade, depending on the girl and depending on the circumstances. There are no obstacles that are put in girls' way anymore. Uh, but the signals are much more subtle. And they can still have kind of a significant effect. Um, the, uh, boy may not, the boys in eighth grade may not think it's cool for the girl to be the best in the math class. So girls uh, don't admit that they know the answers quite as readily. Or some teachers, uh, if faced with a 12-year-old girl who says that she wants to be an engineer or a physicist, may have a somewhat different reaction than they would to a 12-year-old boy who says that he wants to be an engineer or a, a physicist. And these are kind of subtle signals that uh, um, are still reflective of the fact that some stereotypes still exist. You know, they're not right, but these stereotypes hang on for a long time. Um, and the result is that uh, girls in middle school start to drift away from these subjects in numbers much greater than boys do. Boys start to move away from them too, but girls in larger numbers. And it's not because they're not interested, and it's not because they don't have the aptitude for it. It's for other factors. So that's one of the things that, that we're trying to, uh, trying to affect. And it's the reason that we're starting with a focus on middle school girls, because that's where you've, you've got to grab them there, or they're kind of lost to uh, science and um, technology careers um, forever. At least most would be. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples of the sort of things that we're, that we're doing, um, and then move on. Uh, but one of the things that's been very successful for us, and we've only been, we've been doing this less than a year, about 11 months, is a set of community science festivals where um, we find uh, a college campus and we offer on a Saturday or a Sunday a festival, not a conference, not a seminar, but a festival around, the, around science and technology topics. And so I come and show my slides and talk about what it's like to be an astronaut. Um, and we have booths and exhibits, a NASA booth. We'll have booths from uh, the local children's hospital, the local uh, hands-on museum. Uh, we'll have a street fair kind of atmosphere with the DJ playing music and food and face painters uh, so that it's a, uh, an entertaining, enter energetic atmosphere. And then we'll also have workshops given by 
a variety of different professional women from the university and from the surrounding community. So we'll have a veterinarian uh, come in and talk about why she loves being a vet. We'll have a doctor come in and talk about why, how she got interested in medicine and what she's really involved in. We'll get a, an engineer talking about why she likes designing bridges and, and why that's a cool profession to be in. We'll get uh, an aerospace engineer talking about developing a rocket engine and what's, what's cool about that. And what we're finding is that these things are, are, become, are very, very successful. We did one at MIT last Sunday and had 1,100 girls come to the, you know, on a Sunday afternoon. Um, we're, we've got 14 of them scheduled around the country this coming academic year. Um, next one is uh, next Sunday, I guess a week from Sunday in Dayton at Wright State University. And what we're finding is that uh, we get a great response from the girls and we're getting a great response from their parents who are, who are bringing them and a great response from the teachers. So we actually think that there's a, a real groundswell of interest out there. Uh, another of the things that we're, that we're doing, and I'll stop with this example, is a uh, national design competition that we just announced a couple days ago in partnership with Smith College, which is for middle school students to get together in teams and design a toy. Um, it's called Toy Challenge. And our rules, are, our, our motivation is, is pretty simple. Um, you know, no matter whether you're designing a bridge or a rocket engine or a toy, you have to go through the same sort of design process, the same kind of thinking. You have to come up with creative ideas. You have to flesh out those ideas. You have to put sketches on paper. You have to put words on paper. And then you have to develop a model and develop a prototype. And it doesn't matter what it is you're designing, you need to go through the same sort of things. So by having the toy be the thing that you're designing, we think that that competition will appeal to girls as well as boys. And just to ensure that we have lots of girls participating, one of our guidelines is, um, yes, you have to be in middle school, uh, your team has to be at least half girls. And we think that that's, we think we're gonna get a lot of response to that. Hasbro has come in as the, the uh, title sponsor of the, of the competition. So I want all of you to go out there and uh, uh, tell your uh, middle school friends and middle school classrooms to enter Toy Challenge. Um, our, our goal in the things that we're, that we're setting up through the company is uh, not so much to uh, put on individual events, but to, in, in aggregate, make, make it very clear and change people's perceptions towards girls who, who are interested in math and science. Make the culture realize that this is a very cool thing to do. Make the culture appreciate that these, uh, these careers are as appropriate for girls and as are rewarding for girls and young women as they are for boys and young men uh, as, they, as they grow older. And we think that we're actually uh, beginning to have some sort of an impact, impact in that. When I was a little girl, um, I always wanted to fly in space. And amazingly enough, and I still can't believe it to this day, that dream came true for me. I know that through your imagination, your creativity, and your dedication, and through collaborations and connections between university and community, all of you will encourage boys and girls to reach for the stars and help them achieve their dreams too. Thank you very much.